Good morning and welcome to today's virtual bridge session. And uh, we all know that online community is an important way of engaging. And um, well, we have got some top tips. And indeed, it's uh, Avril Edmund from the University of West of Scotland today that's going to be getting us thinking about how we can best facilitate people coming together online. Over to you, Avril. Thank you, Jason. Um, and thanks to um, Jessica and CDN for inviting me along today. So I'll just share my presentation just now. Here we go. So today, um, as Jason has just said, I'm going to be talking about my 10 top tips for building an online community. Um, so I just wanted to start with a little bit of background, so just to explain why I'm here today, why I'm talking about this subject. So um, I taught in life sciences at University of Glasgow, so my background is in teaching um, and in life sciences at University of Glasgow we taught very large cohorts, um, so somewhere in the region of you know, 700 to 750 students. And at this time we used many blended techniques um, and techniques and approaches really to manage these numbers and to help further engage students. And what we found from this was that it really started to encourage a sense of community. And this is where my interest in the importance of online communities actually began with, with this very blended approach. So if we just move to the situation that we're in just now, um, where necessity is dictating that we're moving to a much more online style of delivery. Um, what I'm finding is that there's a lot of sort of staff concern around how to develop activities and assessment, um, especially around the use of technology to take face-to-face um, -face activities online. Um, whereas the need to develop an online community can sort of almost be forgotten about and sort of be a bit of an afterthought. And I really feel that in the panic to do everything, both of these things really go hand in hand. Um, so. Although it is a kind of build it and they will come because students don't have much of an option in terms of how they're going to study maybe for the next little while. I do feel that build it and they will come, but they might go away if they don't like it or they might appear and they might not do very much um, or they might run away screaming into the hills. Um, so we're really in a unique position just now to provide a great experience for students online and maybe just shape their future feelings about online learning. So I'll say today, these are my tips. So basically things I have learned along the way and things I find useful. And to be honest, things that I quite often forget about myself. Um, I forget that um, some of these are important. Sometimes it's a really good reminder for me. So each of these tips I feel could almost be a session on its own. So I'll kind of race through them, but more than happy to have discussion about them at the end. And I've got a few suggestions as we go through about how we might manage each of these things. So just to sort of set the scene, so, you know, what is online community? So obviously it's just a community of people online um, all working towards the same thing. And what I'm trying to encapsulate here is just things that happen really naturally face to face. So obviously if students appear at the campus in your class, they know how to deal with that. They've been dealing with it at school. You turn up, you know that there's going to be a bit of chit chat. You can chat to the people next to you. Um, eventually there'll be silence five minutes in and then the lecture will start. Um, there's also time at the beginning to maybe nip up and talk to the, your lecturer, ask them some questions. So it, it's all pretty ingrained. Whereas these things don't happen naturally, um, you know, in the online environment. So it's more than engagement with the course. It's all the soft stuff that goes around it. So why is this so important? Well, we want to cultivate a community of learners, you know, so we know that people learn better together and um, we want people to be chatting um, and chatting to people. That's how you start to piece information together usually and start pulling it all together into sort of your learning journey. We also really need students to feel involved with this. So we want them to have a sense of belonging. So, I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I can certainly think of a number of occasions where I have felt like I don't belong. And really there is just absolutely nothing more horrible. So what you're trying to do is just get away from that and you know, everyone deserves to be there and everyone should be there and takes part. And so how would I think about doing this sort of thing? So my, my few sort of tips are like thinking like a student. So always think like a student. So what's a student see when they come on to maybe your VLE or come on to your online course? Um, we can all act like students. So no doubt we've all taken part in online courses at some point. And as soon as we do that, we become students. And think of all the things you do and your automatic reaction to some activities that you maybe think are a bit meaningless and pointless. 
the other thing to do is um, to involve the students, you know, involve them in the journey, their online journey, your online journey, you know, keep, keep them involved as far as possible. And I can't overemphasize enough what I found is that building from small, easily achievable tasks is really important and really small steps can increase students' confidence and then start making a huge difference to them as they go through the course. So racing into the tips. <laughs> so tip number one. My tip number one is to communicate. And when I say communicate, I mean communicate a lot. So before they start, this starts before they even come to your online course, uh, very early in the course, throughout the course. So it can be as simple as, you know, how you introduce yourself. Introduce yourself, the other teaching staff, you know, be clear who people are. Um, at the very, very least, provide contact information. Um, videos, bio, uh, maybe some fun facts about yourself, you know, st things that they might have started to learn if they were in a face-to-face -face situation with you, but maybe won't pick up online. And I've added here to use your face, because um, that is the thing that people are going to most identify with. Um, and, you know, they could spot you in a corridor beyond the course, so, so they'll start to link things to you as a person. And that can be quite hard, and I know it's something that some people really struggle with when first moving online, is they don't want to appear in videos, etc. But even if you have a sort of re-talking head at the start of a video before you run in, it can make all the difference. So what you want to do is just welcome the students, make them feel part of something, and they're all in this together, they, they, sh they should be excited about being here. You want to be reducing anxieties and addressing really obvious concerns. So a big important one for online learning is where can they find information? How do they find the online course? Um, is it a middle site? Is it on Teams? Is it another VLE? They can't just appear at a campus reception and ask where your class is. They have to know how to get there to start with. You have to provide that. Remember, they might be working online for the first time. So any information you can give them to support them with that process is brilliant. Um, what can they be doing to prepare? So, you know, they might be really excited about starting. What could they be reading, thinking about before they come along? They want to know what to expect. So how's your course going to run, you know, what can they expect every week to look like, what's it going to be like. Um, and you might at this point want to share some of your own anxieties around it. So if this is your first time doing online teaching, it's fine to say that. It's fine to say this is the first time I've used Microsoft Teams. Let's try it, see how it goes. You possibly don't want to share all your anxieties, but, you know, sharing in a bit of yourself and just, just sharing a bit of your personality is just so important. Racing through, tip number two, clear signposting. So this is really important right from the start. So how are students going to navigate and use this particular learning space? And what you want to start building up in the students is the fact that it's their learning space. So if you can do video tours of your course, so not just a standard Moodle video, an actual video showing around the different areas in your course, the forums, the blocks, the assessment areas, where can they find everything? Um, what about forums? Um, communication is going to be key, so make sure students are clear what each is for. What do you expect them to do with it? Do you expect them to be posting on it every week, every other week? Um, do you expect them to only use it if they need to? Um, my tip here would be have a question and answer forum where students can ask any question they want about the course. Um, and if you've got enough that are willing students and student, you don't answer quickly enough yourself, then you can maybe let students answer this too, start building up you know, them, them sharing their own information. Obviously, I would keep an eye on what they're saying, you know, so you can myth bust if you need to, but it can be really nice to start building up that community feel. Um, have clear communication strategy. How are they going to communicate for all the different reasons? Um, one really useful tip is to standardise your instruction format. So always have, say, the deadline, then the assessment details, and then whatever other the rubric at the bottom. If you set something up and they get used to it, then they'll, they'll start expecting it that way and they, they know how to find the details for it. And just a wee silly one, but provide some instruction on how they can maybe complete their online profile or edit their own preferences. And this just starts the process of them totally owning the space. Um, and again, join in, ensure you have a profile or photo also, so that you know, they can see that you're part of the space too. Tip number three would be to break the ice. And I would say, and keep breaking it and breaking it again. So if you think about a classroom face-to-face -face setting, you're always learning about each other. And you really want that to continue on and on you know, throughout your course. 
So um, I would say icebreakers, the word always makes me shudder thinking about icebreakers. But, you know, what makes a good icebreaker activity? They don't need to be scary. So I would say do fun things. Um, this is especially important to start with. So we've done some really, really sort of unrelated things like, you know, what's your favourite food, favourite movie, worst movie and why, put photos up. You know, just make it kind of low stakes. So you can, you can keep, make it compulsory, but make sure it's not worth a huge amount to them. And low stakes can also refer to, um, well, I certainly feel that if an icebreaker question is too personal, I can find that to be quite high stakes straight away. You know, for instance, something like, um, you know, share an interesting fact about yourself. Oh, I just, I just think, oh, I'm so not interesting. Oh, I don't want to be sharing that with my cohort straight away. Oh, you know, so try and keep it kind of light and eerie and fun. Um, things you can do here is just have like anonymous polls, questionnaires, and share the class data. So even though you're not sharing individual information, you're sharing the sort of feel of the class, like, you know, and what they feel they're at the course for. Um, obviously make it interactive, allow students to engage with others, but it has to be structured, really easy to do, especially at the start, and real clarity over what they need to do. So it increases their confidence, and this can increase their confidence in using maybe some of the tools you might want them to use later in the course for something, you know, higher stakes. So if you want them to use discussion forums later in the course, get them started posting early on discussion forums about other things. And to provide clarity, there is nothing better than involving the teaching staff, sharing some information about yourself and showing them by doing that exactly what you're expecting of them. And then I would say from here, keep it going. So these activities can be used throughout. You could use them once a week. You could see what's happening. You could see that they're already engaging with other things and you don't need to continue them. Keep it quite relaxed. Um, but I would also say if you can create a place for informal chat and discussion, um, for example, um, Microsoft Teams can be really good for this, but you want a place where they can just talk nonsense, if you like, they can just share random nonsense about telly or whatever else is going on in their lives. Um, but what you want to do is just build their confidence and build some safety around their later tasks. So the next step is to provide structure and I think this is really important because if students know where they're at and they know what to expect, that will develop their confidence. So how will students know what's to be done when they've got to do it? Um, at Glasgow Uni we used a weekly forum post or a weekly email and they knew, students knew that at nine o'clock on a Monday a post would go out reminding them of all the things they have to do that week um, and telling them what the plan is for the week. And to save time, we used to write these in advance and just tweak them on the week that we were going to post them. But we'd have them all sitting in a folder ready to go year on year so, so you could lift and lay. Um, other things I really like are things like having an activities or assessment handbook so the students just know that you can find everything in there. Um, clarity over when activities and information are going to be released to the students. This is so important to them and might seem so little to you, but to them, it, it's, you know, it's what they're hanging on. And it can be useful, but not always possible to have a similar structure each week. Again, it can just train students into, you know, this is what you're going to expect. Oh, each week I'm going to have some videos, a quiz um, and a forum discussion. And then they know where they're at. Um, in terms of Moodle, I really like completion activities and I use these in several different ways. So I use them to guide students, so restrict the activity unless they have completed the previous activity or simply just give them tick boxes and just say, you know, week one, I expect you to post to the forum so you can tick the box there and change your profile, tick the box there. And then they know they're completing as they go. Um, Tip number five is so important, especially just now, which is just mind the gap. So try to make no assumptions whatsoever about what students do and do not know about university study or studying online. And this is so important right at this moment because you've got to be aware that many students who are about to study online may never have wanted to do this and we may never have chosen to do this. And we know that students needing most support are the very least likely to ask. So how are you going to find these students? How are you going to identify them? It's just not as easy for students to ask each other. So, you know, if you're talking about something and the students don't know what it is, they can't just nudge the person next to them and say, what is that? Where to find that? Um, it, it's 
more difficult to ask these questions. You'll be aware that some students have many more barriers. This could be their prior experience, this could be their available technology, this could be a time and a space to study. So it's just taking all these things into account and allowing for as much flexibility as possible. So think about bandwidth and the technology required when you're developing things. Um, asynchronous activities are brilliant because they're so flexible, they can you know, do them whenever they get the opportunity to. Synchronous activities are lovely to provide that human elephant, el <laughs> human elephant, human element, um, and allow students to sort of see each other at a live event. But if you can provide an asynchronous option, so sort of more move towards the hybrid model, um, and ask your students, you know, if you're thinking about using a given technology or running a live event, ask your students if it's going to work for them um, and find out what they can do. Tip number six is just so important, is just be present. So I think there's a bit of a fallacy around online learning that you build it and then they do it and you just walk away and leave them to it. And that is absolutely not the case at all. Um, it's a real opportunity to actually communicate more with your students than you ever have before. And again, this could be through weekly communications, just keeping in touch with them just popping your face up every so often in things so that they get to see you and trying to keep them motivated. Be visible in these activities, join in um, forums, glossaries, you can respond, you can like, you can reply um, and students see that and they take a lot from it. You know, it might be just a simple like to you, but to them, you know, they're thinking, well, that's, you know, they've read it, they, they, they agree with me. And feedback on their tasks. Um, it's so important to also keep um, office hours of some description. So you can do this by scheduling a live meeting space, have synchronous chat sessions, um, or even a channel for confidential communications. Um, the last one is so important because quite often students, if they need to tell you something and they can't see an obvious way to do that confidentially, they'll just post it to a forum. So they'll just panic and just post it anyway and you, you don't want them doing that. And then for all this be present stuff, it's such a soft tip but really allow yourself time for this because it does take time, but you've got to give yourself that space to do all this. Tip number seven is to encourage engagement. And this is throughout the whole course. And it's not just students with students and students with each, it's both students with each other and with you. And students with each other, especially peer support, doesn't happen naturally all the time. You don't quite often need to structure this. So you can build activities that allow for this. Um, good things are like um, group work and sort of breakout discussions. And sometimes staff feel that this is a, a sort of panic to create, you know, a big activity, but it can be really small tasks. It can be, you know, watch this video and then your group discuss and answer these questions, feedback on something as a group, um, do a quiz together as a group and feedback. You know, it can be quite small things just to get people used to working as a group and to encourage each other to comment and discuss with each other what's going on. And again, just lead by example and just be part of all of this, you know, join in with these sort of things. Um, and one thing we learned at Glasgow about group work activities, especially online, um, was when students said they didn't like doing online group work activities, we actually increased the number of activities we asked them to do and asked them to do it every week instead of running up to a large group work activity. And what we actually found was that students just got used to it early on um, and actually started engaging with it and felt much more comfortable with it much quicker. And again, as I've already said, provide some informal spaces just for that general chat and informal discussion. Tip number eight is to monitor engagement. Um, so you can't tell, they're not sitting in front of you, you can't see the whites of their eyes and see whether they're glazing over, so you need to find other ways to do this. So obviously there's lots of ways you can do this with analytics, so um, look at activity completion, look at the logs, look at conditional activities, and again just allocate yourself some time to do this because otherwise it'll fall off the list. And then I, I find it really useful to provide what I call a nudge, and that's when things aren't kind of people aren't engaging quite as much as I'd like. I might put wee comments out saying, you know, oh, I can see 20% of students have responded to this. It'd be good to hear more opinion. Um, I've also used things like just making them feel like they're maybe missing out. Oh, there's a really good discussion going on in the forum just now. Um, that would be really useful for your reflection activity at the end of week eight. 
and students were like, oh, we better go and have a wee look. And try to remind them they wanted to come in this course and they wanted to do it. Um, other things you can do are share some of the work the students are doing. So you can maybe, you know, some flash up some examples of some of the glossary entries that are coming in and students will see it and remember they've, they're supposed to do it. And then finally, what are you going to do if they don't engage or if um, there's low engagement going on with some students? So I would say have a plan for this. So think at the start, what is low and non-engagement? What does that look like? Um, and how are you going to identify it and what are you going to do about it when you see it? And don't be afraid to change things. So if students are not understanding really what you're asking them to do for the given activity, change the instructions and try and make it much clearer for them. And remember, a really small change can have a really huge impact on students. Tip number nine is a big one and it's um, trying to de-stress the assessments. So online assessments, for whatever reason, um, seem to bring out stress in staff and students, which is, which is fair enough. So things we found that really helped with this was to have a dedicated discussion forum or thread based on each assessment. So students knew that if they had any questions, they could go to that forum or thread and have a look there first to see if the if their question had been answered. Um, as with all your face-to-face -face teaching, clear instructions and supports. And I would say tell students everything and tell them everything several times. And that includes things like the deadline, where they can find rubrics, where they can find exemplars, and just be really clear on the mechanics of submission. So how are they going to submit? When are they going to submit? And students can get really worked up about that sort of thing. Um, if they can't see the submission inbox, but you know it's hidden and you were going to you know, open it in week 11, they don't know, they don't know when it's going to be. So even if you just say it will be hidden until Monday, whenever, you know, it can just make all the difference. As can providing formative and practice opportunities. And this might be a nonsense practice activity. So this might be as simple as here's a submission inbox, submit anything. And it just gives them the opportunity to go in, have a wee nosy around, add a document, press submit. And once they've pressed the button, it's just amazing how the stress levels just seem to drop with them. And my final part for this is that cut yourself a little bit of slack too. Online assessments can be really stressful for lecturers too. So consider in advance, what's the grading and feedback loop? How do you want this to work? How can you work with technology to make this work for you? And have a plan B. So what are the risks involved with the assessment? So usually it's Wi-Fi issues or students not being able to submit in the last 20 minutes before the closing of the assessment inbox. What are you going to do? You know, and be clear to students, what do you want them to do if they're having any issues? And again, that just takes down the whole level of stress. And my final tip is enjoy it. Or I have said, um, tried to enjoy it. Um, basically, be on the journey with your students. You know, um, when I first did fully online teaching, I was I was totally blown away with it. I really enjoyed the whole process. It was something I felt I really engaged with the students, and I really, you know, really took you know have a great passion for doing this. And what I find is that enjoyment in, in presenting the course is really infectious, um, and you can pass that on to the students, and you can champion their efforts. They're your cohort and you want them to succeed and you can go along with them and help create that. And you can involve the students in creating and sharing resources as part of that journey, then they'll feel involved too. Um, I would say this is also part of, I really enjoy this part of it, but it's your chance to experiment. So use activities and technologies you might have not already tried or you might not otherwise try, because why would you? Um, and it's also a chance to network. So talk to colleagues, um, use online networks, ask people what they're doing, find out with others, you know, find inspiration from these virtual bridge sessions, Twitter, other online networks. It's an excuse to actually go out there and have a look at what others are doing, which sometimes it's not that easy to do. So anyway, that was quite a whistle stop tour. So um, I'll stop talking now, but um, thank you. And if you've got any questions. 
Yeah, very good. Thank you very much, Avril. Um, well, uh, can I start off with a quick one there? Um, about uh, obviously there are different types of engagement possible because of people's uh, different students' character. What sort of combination of these tips works? Do you think for the flexibility that allows the shrinking violets, the lurkers, the the, the more reluctant, and indeed the the extroverts perhaps to all engage fruitfully? Um, that that's where we found the group work quite useful, and um, we found um helping them define their roles in groups quite useful and um, so the shrink environment may never want to be the presenter but that does not mean that they're not feeding really well into the sort of the, the group task and um, so we actually defined um you know depending on the number of people you're putting into the group we actually defined roles for them and asked them to try and put their own names to the roles as one of the first activities. We found that worked really well. Um, and also in terms of online in general, um, sort of who knows, people who are quiet face to face are not the ones who are necessarily quiet online. And uh, my final thing is, is lurking that bad, <laughs> you know, um, as long as, you know, you're touching base with them and they feel they're getting something out of it and, you know, enjoying the experience, that's fine. <sighs> Very much. Now, uh, for those who've got a microphone open, then if you want to give any background on your experience of this or any top tips yourself or any questions for Avril. Hi, Avril. Uh, well, not so much a question, but uh, one of my practices during the normal classes was uh, at the end, <coughs> excuse me, I would normally give them 10, 15 minutes and we would play some kind of a game like what search or hangman. <laughs> and that brings everybody out, even the shrinking violets. So I would do that now online as well. And at the end of the lesson, we go into the, either the collaboration section or a, the breakout room and I use the whiteboard and then everybody can do the hangman and they can take turns on the screen <laughs> to put the number or the letters and the words in. And that really breaks up the session before the next day. And at the end, everyone is laughing and joking. So we leave on a good note. That's a, that's a brilliant idea. I really like that. I think anything that brings out the competitive element, it's also yes. also yes. quite nice. Yes. <laughs> but especially if you can get them competitive in a team, you know, then they, they start bonding in their group. Yeah. Uh, anything that does that, brilliant. Thank you, Nadra. Okay, any further questions or comments or reflections on I'm, experience? I'm, I'm really interested in this whole engagement piece. Do you have guidance from your institution about that percentage or is that devolved to the tutor? Um, you know, because we, we hear attendance and engagement measurements all the time. And we know for UKVI, you know, the, they, they know that we can't have our tier four students face to face at the moment. So we have to record attendance and engagement. But there's, there's no agreed definition of exactly what we mean by, um, well, by, by attendance as well, you know, but, but by engagement. I completely agree. I think it's something that is going to have to change. And um, so um, I couldn't agree more that it, it, at the moment it feels like it's almost left up to a lecturer to make decisions mm. on this. And um, I can only talk from my own personal experience. So the way I used to manage this was having what I'd class as a, an attendance activity, which yep. to mm -hmm. me is compulsory, but doesn't add to their final grade. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so that's where, you know, sort of restricting access can work quite nicely because you can be saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to let you submit until you've, you know, watched this video and we can't tell you watched it, but until you've had a look at this video and, you know, yeah. answered the quiz questions associated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, switched it to play, you know, but you have a bit of control over that. And, and there's always going to be that question, you know, um, one of our summer schools we had students um, telling us that they were sitting together to watch the online recorded sessions so it would only log on one student's account yeah. <laughs> and i mean good if they were fantastic <laughs> you know yeah. but you don't know <laughs> no that's Susie, a good point yeah i have a suggestion if i may oh, go it. Uh, well one of the things i do in terms of uh, recording their engagement and attendance is to have a simple quiz at the end of every lesson and it's done mm -hmm. in form. Mm -hmm. So every week can, it can just be my, um, easily edited to match that week. And at the end, I asked them to do that quiz as a way of being in the class. And also, I don't know if you use Insight, it's an app that's available on Teams. 
and then insight will let you know straight away which student have been engaged throughout the week or throughout the month so just mm -hmm. add that to your team and that way you can easily just by looking at it know who's been attending who's mm. been engaged and who hasn't that's helpful yeah we, we were we were thinking about you know setting up this what what again as you said avril it's about communication making the expectations very clear to your to your students and and indeed your tutors and so you know to to have um watched one um one video done one quiz posted once to their reflective blog um so and i was wondering actually and so what other people's views are you know maybe in that quiz actually we could also include a question on how are you feeling that's what we do yeah. how are you feeling ah, how yeah do you feel so they're today? not all knowledge based oh, yeah because no, no. i think the tutors were thinking very much knowledge based so that no no yeah. this is just an informal <laughs> quiz just so they know that we know that they've been there how do you feel how do you find the lesson what was the best part or anything up to you uh, yeah so a bit like the one minute paper yeah, yeah. And also yeah. You could also use... turn it on its head, you know, does engagement actually matter that much? We get really hung up on engagement. We get absolutely hung up in it. Mm -hmm. But is that what, if your end game is that they can do a certain set of tasks or they, they have some particular knowledge, why do we get so hung up on engagement? And I, I really, I wonder sometimes, you know, we're asking people to work outside their comfort zones. Does it matter if they do it all in the last week? Does it actually matter if that's how they learn if they're a crammer does that matter to us if the end game is that they pass the module i completely agree with you joe no I, I think that i think that's a real good point and um, my only concern is like it's quite useful to pick up you know maybe students who have issues earlier yep. on i think that yep. that's my only <laughs> feeling yeah. it, it's nice to identify any students yeah. who maybe and it's that, a really simple yeah. issue and that's well, where that brings it's so difficult difference. that ukbi <laughs> hasn't defined what the heck they mean by engagement because whilst agreeing with you I, I don't want us to use lose our license. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and that brings us one, one second to the main two. Flexibility coming up again. Now, for the purpose of finishing off the recording for today, uh, I'll just thank Avril once again for um, for some te for 10 tips that uh, we can all think about again and some great ongoing discussion there. And so with that, thank you very much and thanks for joining.